Hi, and welcome to Spaminar, the first in a series of online gatherings of live theater prop professionals and anyone interested in stage props. My name is Jim Guy, and I'm the Properties Director at Milwaukee Repertory Theater and President of the Society of Property Artisan Managers. We're an association of professionals working in not-for-profit regional theater, opera, large-scale entertainment events, colleges, and universities. Our mission is to serve as an educational vehicle and resource for professional prop department managers and educators. Last month, SPAM celebrated its 27th annual conference. Because of the pandemic, we held our very first virtual conference, which was a truly international affair. We have over 150 active members reaching from Hawaii to Ireland and Canada to Florida. Okay, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session. So write your questions in the chat field down there. Our moderator is Stephanie Hansen, University of Delaware Associate Professor of Theater and Property Supervisor and Resident Scenic Designer at the Resident Ensemble Players at University of Delaware. She'll select a few questions to ask our guests today. Be sure to stay to the end of the session to hear about the great lineup of Spaminar guests for the rest of the year and all the other ways you can interact with and learn from our membership. Our first guest presenter is Spam's very own Nikki Coolis. Nikki is proud to be starting her seventh season as the prop master at First Stage, our nationally recognized theater for young audiences here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Here in Wisconsin, Nikki has worked as a prop master and prop artisan at many theaters. Some of her favorites include Skylight Music Theater, Milwaukee Chamber Theater, and Renaissance Theater Works. For eight summers, she called Winona, Minnesota her home, where she served as the properties director at the Great River Shakespeare Festival. Recently, she began repairing and building some beautiful fun puppets for Cole's Wild Theater at the Milwaukee County Zoo. You'll see some of those in the presentation today. So here, without further ado, are my friends and colleagues, moderator Stephanie Hansen and our presenter, Nikki Koulis. Hello, my name is Nikki Koulas. I am the prop master at First Stage Children's Theater in Milwaukee. Uh, and I am here to do the first Spaminar, which I'm very excited about. Thank you for watching our first Spaminar and I hope you uh, continue to watch the rest of them because I think they're gonna be really great. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about puppets. And what I want to start with is the five types of puppets. Uh, these are categorized kind of based off of how they're manipulated. So our five categories are hand puppet, where the mouth is normally operated by your hand, um, or the glove style, where you're manipulating like this, but your hand is the main thing that's manipulating it. Uh, rod puppets, kind of what it sounds like, you're manipulating with rods. So whether that is the rod attached to the head, uh, mechanisms in there to move the mouth, but you're holding the rod, uh, rods attached to hands that move around, um, super traditional ones, which were giant and up in the air, and you would hold rods to move them around. A lot of parades use that style. Uh, then you have string puppets, which marionettes. That's kind of the iconic version of string puppets. Uh, here at First Aid, we've done a few other versions of that, but marionettes are the base. Uh, and you manipulate with strings, a lot of times from above. And then you have shadow puppets. Shadow puppets, exactly what they sound, like it's shadow plays. So anytime you have a cutout or a 3D object or um, even you know using your hands to create shadows, that's shadow puppetry. So you have those, and then you have body puppets. Body puppets are those big ones that take your whole body and multiple puppeteers to manipulate them. So think Warhorse or King Kong. Uh, here at First Stage, we have a giant bumble for Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer that someone's inside of and two people have manipulate the arms from the outside. So those are your five categories, hand, rod, string, shadow, and body puppets. And I know what you're thinking. There's someone out there going, but Nikki, there's hybrids and there's more than that. Totally true. Uh, totally true. There are uh, some people that categorize an eight, some people that categorize four. For our purposes and mostly at first stage and in um, the shows that we do and work with, we base it on five and it's just how the main part of them is manipulated. Uh, if you look at Muppets, there's a lot of Muppets that are hand and rod puppets, so they're a hybrid. So yes, there are hybrids out there 
uh, buraku, if you're doing that style, um, that can be considered hand puppet. If you're manipulating with rod, it could be raw. Like, yes, there are hybrids out there. For our purposes, there are the five. Uh, and here at first stage, uh, which you can see I am in the shop right now, uh, here at first stage, we use all five of those. Uh, in fact, this year of our 11 shows, five of them had puppetry in them of some kind. Um, and I believe we hit all of the styles of puppetry this year. So puppets are a thing. I love puppets. Let's talk some more about puppets. Uh, this, uh, this webinar is mostly gonna be about hand puppets. That's what we're gonna try and focus on um, and some of the techniques uh, that we use to make hand puppets. But a lot of the products and techniques I'm gonna show you uh, are universal. So if you're doing a rod puppet, you can use these kind of eyes. Or if you're doing uh, some kind of body puppet, you can use these kind of stitches. So it's a good kind of just general overview. This is not the end all be all of how puppets are made and every single thing about them. We're gonna talk about a bunch of stuff. I'm sure everyone out there who has built a puppet has their own tips and tricks and things that um, work for them. And that is awesome. I am always trying to learn new tips and tricks. So if you know about our Facebook page, uh, you can go on there and put your tips and tricks and let all of us know about them. Uh, this will also be recorded and put um, up as well so you can watch this again. So puppets, foam. <laughs> Most puppets are built out of foam. So let's talk about some foam. Most common type of foam that you would use in a puppet is a reticulated foam. Uh, it basically means you might've heard open cell foam or porous. Um, it has a bunch of different densities. This is <laughs> a brontosaurus puppet from a show this season uh, put together by my lovely artisan who may or may not be on here. I didn't look and see. Uh, so this is a brontosaurus puppet. This is reticulated foam. So you can see that it's very porous. Uh, we got it in one inch thick. It comes in all different thicknesses. The great thing about reticulated foam is that it dries faster than other foams. So if you have sweaty hands, this is awesome. Uh, you can stitch into it too. You can glue it. It's really great. This specific stuff is called dry fast. Um, I believe it's just an industry name. So reticulated foams. Next, you have the denser closed cell foams. Uh, those are things like if you've heard of L200 or flotation foam, those are in this line. They're smooth, they're dense, again, come in all different thicknesses, different densities. These are great if you need something stiff. So like if you need this mouth to be really, really stiff, or if you need this part to be stiff and this be a different foam, it's really great for that. It's also really great for patterning. So this turtle <laughs> was uh, originally patterned out in this style foam and then made in a different foam for the real puppet. So great for patterning. You can draw over it, see where you want, different things, cuts, that kind of stuff. So this is a L200 or flotation foam. L200 is used by cosplayers. So you can get it at your local craft uh, store now, which you could not in the past, which is awesome. Um, if you go with more flotation foam, that kind of, you can't paint it as well. You can still use it the same way you do this, uh, but it doesn't take paint as well. So we have to do a couple little tricks to make that happen. L200 tends to take uh, foam, bleh, paint <laughs> so much better. So that's that. Uh, you can also get speaker or headliner foam, depending on what you need. Every puppet needs something different. So. This is like a headliner foam. It's a reticulated foam. It also has a cloth backing because most of the time when these are put into trucks and vehicles, uh, it's glued in. So they need a backing to glue that onto. Uh, speaking of backings, you can also get foam that has a cloth backing on it already. This is basically an upholstery foam. If you've worked with any kind of upholstery, you know exactly what I'm talking about, um, which is also technically open cell. Um, what makes the cloth backing awesome is you can stitch into it. You can stitch into the reticulated, but more than likely it's going to pull out. Eventually over time, that's just what happens. This is a little bit sturdier. If you can't find this and purchase this, you can make your own. You can take foam and you can um, add cloths to the back of it, which is super helpful. 
Uh, other foams, we talked about upholstery foam, uh, craft foam, fun foam, whatever you want to call it. This stuff is amazing. Uh, if you want to add details to things, if you want to pattern, these are actually old patterns for puppets, uh, just so you're not wasting your more expensive foams and you're trying to just kind of figure out angles and things. Uh, this works great. Totally doable, totally paintable. It is made for kids to do fun crafts. So, foam. Um, one thing about all of these foams, all of the reticulated foams and upholstery foams, most of them you can dye. So if you're doing a puppet that doesn't need a skin on it and you just want to see the foam, more than likely you can dye it the color you need it, which is super sweet. Or if you are doing a puppet that has a thinner fabric, you can dye the underneath so that the colors all kind of blend together and match. Now, all foams will break down over time. That is just a thing. If you look at old chairs, the upholstery foam just kind of dies out after wear. It's a thing that happens. Be prepared for it. It could be years. It could be months with a hard show. It's going to break down. Sorry, I have no better answer for you for that. It's just a thing. Now, let's talk about glues. So here are some different glues that you can use. I'm going to tilt you down slightly and knock things over. Um, Someone asked me once if there is a greener, safer, anything for glues for foam. Quite honestly, I have not found it, at least nothing that works as well as contact cement. If you're doing seams, like on this guy, all these seams are contact cemented together and they don't come apart unless you rip the foam. When I've tried other glues, it doesn't work as well. It doesn't hold up as long. So that being said, it is toxic, it is flammable, please wear a respirator, do it in an open, like well-vented area, especially if there's people around or you're going to take your respirator off when you're working on a different part of it, it will still off-gas. So I'm sure most people in costumes know about barge because of shoes. Uh, there's also different kinds of um, contact adhesives, this one's called master cement, one we use mostly. I'm gonna tell you right now, get one of these. They're so helpful. And when you use a sea wrench to open these, when they get stuck, you tend to kind of make it all gross and weird. One of these is awesome. Just throwing that out there. They don't pay me to say that. Um, so those are your contact cements. You can also use spray adhesives. They make ones just for upholstery foam. So I was talking about putting that backing, your own cloth backing on a foam. You can totally use this and glue it all down. Um, works really, really well. Obviously, different types of spray foams work as well. Um, be careful just because you always want to test to make sure, uh, depending on what foam you're using. Just always do a test. Uh, sometimes like epoxy kind of things will eat away the foam and you don't want that. Uh, when you're using fabric stuff, fabric glues are great. Tacky glue is one of my favorites. Um, it works amazing with the fun foam stuff too. Or if you're adding details, um, if you're adding parts of eyes or eyelids, that kind of thing, those work great. E6000 is also an awesome one. It's silicone based, so there is a smell, um, but it tends to be very flexible and very washable. You should wash your puppets every once in a while. It keeps them going for a lot longer. Slide that over. Uh, speaking of clean, so one thing I always tell our young performers if they're going to be working with puppets, wash your hands. Sanitizer's great. Sanitizer does not get off all the gummy, gross, nasty, oily, whatever's on your hand. So if you are going to work with a puppet and you have to put your hand inside or on the rod as well if you're doing rod puppets, always wash your hands before working on doing puppeteering, anything with a puppet it will save your puppet throughout the years. Um, I just took apart a few puppets that had not been cleaned in a long time and the white fabric on the inside was brown, just from stuff on hands. It happens, it's a thing, just try and eliminate it as much as possible. <clears throat> that's my, that's my uh, public service announcement for that. So we talked about adhesives, let's talk about mouths. <clears throat> so 
on your puppets, throw him down there, on your puppets, you're gonna have mouths and mouth plates, right? So I like to use plastics for my mouth plates. Uh, I know a lot of people will use cardboard or chipboard. Um, they're also fah shape. Once it's heated up, it gets nice and stiff. I don't feel like it's stiff enough for a puppet that needs to last a really long time or get pretty much very much abused. So, but there is an option. You can do fah shape. Um, you can do thermoplastics as well. Um, if you are doing a show that is outside in the sun, be careful with thermoplastics and be careful with some of your like hot glue because it will melt. I have fixed those puppets too. So, but you have, you can, this is Wonderflex. You can use that as well, especially like if you're trying to do beaks or anything like that. Um, what I tend to use is Sintra. It's a plastic uh, and that's the, the like industry name for it, Sintra. Uh, you can also take a plastic bin lid and cut that open and use that as well. All of it works. Just having that extra stiffness helps a lot when you're trying to move your mouth. Now, I've done a couple little examples for you on different ways to basically keep your hand in there. Now, you can do a pocket. So it's just a pocket that you can put your hand into. Super simple, super easy. Not much more to say about that. It's really simple and easy. This is just a pocket that was made with two pieces of fabric, muslin, um, and then glued down on the bottom. But I can slide my hand right in. It's super easy to get on and off. Um, that's about it. Uh, you can go a little bit further. And this is more if only one person is going to be using the puppet and not multiple people. But you can basically do finger holes in there. You can stitch down finger holes, uh, which means it's a super tight fit, but it's fit for one person. So here at First Stage, we use young performers and we also double cast. So one puppet is being used by two different cast members, depending on the day of the show, that kind of thing. Um, so they could have vastly different size hands. So what I tend to do is actually this style. I've just put elastic on the bottom for the thumb and a large piece of elastic on the top. Now, the reason that you see foam on here is something that I did not think about when I was starting out, but it's super important and I want you all to know about this. Half the time when a puppet is being built, a puppeteer is building their own puppet or someone like a prop shop or a puppet department is building a puppet for a puppeteer. In both cases, the puppeteer's comfort is super important, super important. Um, so what I do here is I put foam in, this is just upholstery foam, so that their hand actually curves. So you can see the curve in my hand here. What that does is make it a little bit more comfortable inside there for their hand. Now, most puppeteering, you're dropping your thumb and your hand, your top is just kind of staying there moving a little bit. That's kind of because that's how we talk. My bottom jaw is dropping. If I talked with like this, I would be doing this all the time. And that's crazy. Um, so you want to keep your top stiff, your bottom moving around. If you try and make your hand as flat as possible and put your thumb under here, it's kind of uncomfortable. If you curve your fingers a little bit, you have a lot more range of motion in your thumb. So that's why I put this little dome in here. So you, the puppeteer is not forcing their hand into that shape. It automatically is doing it. So I have my little mouth. Um, and this is also because our puppeteers have different size hands and we use puppets over and over. So we try not to completely fit it to them. If you have a puppeteer that's having an issue with this, um, I tend to put the elastic further up so it catches my fingers more. Uh, you can put it back further and then also put this little pocket on front. So if someone's having issues with their fingers popping up, that'll kind of help keep them down for them. So that's that. You can see, I just have felt in here. Um, felt works great. This is spray adhesive on. I typically put the mouth plates into the puppet before doing this so that this can kind of cover any ugly. Um, but for this purpose, I did it already so you can see it. So when you do, you can see that I have stitched a lot of these and I'm using plastic. So what I do is pre-drill some holes. 
make sure you sand or clean these out so there's no sharp edges. Stitch one side. I put the tab underneath so that when it's flat, there's just a little gap and it makes it a little bit easier to get your finger into versus being completely flat and tight. And then all I do is fold this tab over so it's like a quarter of an inch underneath those holes and then pull it up. And that's how I get this to be tight in there. It will stretch out over time. These top ones will stretch out over time. It's a thing that happens. The more they stretch out, the easier it is to actually pinch them up and put a little stitch into the top to retighten them. Um, but it happens, wear and tear happens on puppets. It's a thing. So that is mouth plates. Now, slide this one over. I'm gonna talk quick because we had mentioned the puppeteer's comfort, right? So I wanna talk about where your armhole is. And this is something that is that you figure out before you put all the details on. He's got eyes already, don't look at them. So for this, I use the L200 for patterning. This is a pattern from another puppet. So if I wanna put a, a hole in here for my arm, you can see where the mouth is. What I want to do is make it comfortable for them. At any time your wrist is like this in a puppet, it's really, really uncomfortable. So you can see where the mouth is. What I wanna do is have the hole coming so that my wrist is straight. So that would make the hole down here. If I put the hole up here, I'm going in like this, which is okay as long as the puppet is out front. As soon as you try and do anything like this, your wrist starts bending weird. So that's something you wanna really consider. Um, if you think about the Muppets and Sesame Street, the way that they're done is straight up with their wrist bent. So as long as your wrist is at a 90, it's not so bad. But if you push it forward, so if I'm doing this, my wrist is straighter. So if I'm up like this and my mouth or my hole for my arm is a little bit um, back versus directly under underneath, so it'd be like this, that will help with your with the wrist. Um, if you are doing anything with a 90 degree, so your puppet is here, that's totally fine as long as your wrist is straight. Um, and if your puppet is too long and it starts pushing down into here, which I can show you with this one, my hand is here, my elbow's right here. So I'm not gonna be able to comfortably do this unless I have it pushed forward. Uh, another way we did that is with this turtle. Yes, I'm putting a puppet on my head. It's a thing. Um, we made this so that it stretched forward versus trying to do it here because that would be really uncomfortable. So this way, it's a little bit more comfortable. Um, another thing, if you have a puppet that you're holding, having the whole kind of go in more like this is a little bit nicer than like directly in and doing that. So trying to have that wrist, super important. And this is the stage where you kind of figure that out. So please make sure your puppeteers are comfy because they will make you happier when it comes to maintenance and things like that. So um, I'll put them down here. So let's talk about skinning. So best thing for these type of puppets is an anti-pill fleece, which you can pick up Joann's, Hobby Lobby, those kind of places. Um, if you wanna go with something a little bit nicer, Antron fleece, you used to really be only able to get it in white and had to dye it yourself, and it was expensive to get it in colors. All those prices are dropping now. So you can have professionally looking puppets a lot cheaper than you used to be able to. Antron fleece. It looks great. Um, it's a little bit thicker than this kind of fleece. This is just anti-pill. Um, if you go to Joann's and you look at blizzard fleece, that pills a lot over time. So try and stick away from that kind, even though those tend to come in way cooler textures and colors. It's a thing. So, um, so what I have here, these two that you've seen, uh, what I do is once I have my pattern in my foam all done, I put my fleece and pin it right on. I feel like it makes it a lot easier to figure out your tucks, to figure out your darts, that kind of thing when it's just on there. You'll also have less seams. This one's pretty round. It doesn't have a lot of cut-ins, like if you're doing a pumpkin. That's a different kind of thing that you might want to fit on and then take off and do some and come back on, but simpler ones. 
just pin them on. Um, one thing, I'm gonna stand up weirdly here. One thing, when you do these seams, you want to leave a half inch gap bet between them because the fleece will stretch. So if I was doing this, I would put, I'd fold this over and stick my pin in. And then my next part, trim this down, but I would stick it so that there's about a, a quarter inch seam, like opening right there. And then when I do my hand stitching, that will pull that all together. Same thing when you're doing these darts, just kind of pull it up, mark your darts. Um, if I'm doing this on here, stitching on, I will cut this open, fold them in the same way, and hand stitch on here. You can totally machine stitch as well. Um, if you're mis machine stitching, you would do all your pins, mark everything, take it off, do your machine stitching, leaving the one back seam open, put it all back on, pin it on, and then hand stitch your back seam. Super easy. I tend to do them all hand stitched if there's only like this amount on there, just cause it's easier, it's already on there and I can fit it all in place quicker. So, um, stitches. Let's talk about stitches. So ladder stitch, most common stitch for that. But did you know there's a puppet stitch? And it's also sometimes called a Henson stitch. So that's a thing. So if you are doing a ladder stitch, this is what it's gonna look like. What you're doing, if the dotted line is the seam that you're dealing with, what you're doing is going across, down, so you can see where mine's popping out. You're gonna pull this through without getting it tangled. And you're gonna do the exact same thing going over. So you're gonna go in, down and pull. And then when once you have some of these done, it's nicer to pull as you're going. But what you'll do is tighten your seam together. So that's what your seam is gonna look like, you know, fluffed and look nicer than that. But that's what a ladder stitch is, most common one used. This is what it looks like when you're actually doing it. Um, because you will have those pieces of your fleece folded back and you're stitching into the fold of those pieces. So this is what it's going to end up looking like. Now, if you want to do the puppet stitch slash Henson stitch, you're basically doing the same thing, but making triangles instead of a ladder. So this is what the Henson stitch looks like. What you do is if I started here, like I actually did start right there. Um, so wherever you start, you go up and you go down like the ladder and you pull that out and then you go back up to the hole that you just did or that you started with. Um, you don't go through the same hole, but you get really, really close to it uh, and your back will end up flat like that. So if I was doing this, I went, I came out here. So I'm gonna go up by this hole I'm going to put my needle down like I did for the ladder stitch. I'm going to pull this. And when I have my needle coming out, I'm going below where I was just there. So you're making little triangles essentially. So if I was going to continue, I would go back up to this hole. Well, close to this hole, go down so that I'm past. Make this a little easier. I'm going to bring my needle out past this. So I want to bring my needle out down here. Not get it stuck. So that's, that's what you're creating. You're creating these little triangles. Now, again, if you're looking at it in your seam, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see those little triangles going back and forth. With this stitch, you only want to do like five or six and then tighten. Um, it's going to make your seam very tight, but it's also going to be hard. Like if you do this entire seam and then try and tighten and pull, it's going to be a pain in the butt. Like it's going to be. So if you have this, you want to pull now. It's also yarn, so it's always going to be weird, but you want to pull a lot sooner. So that's a Henson stitch. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that all of these stitches 
all these hand stitches and stuff, they're all online. They so are. Um, but now that you know that there's a puppet slash Henson stitch, you know what to look for. But knowing some of these is really great. Um, there's a lot of cosplay out there. Thank you, cosplay, because you have made props so much easier. Um, so like this is for fursuits, knowing different types of stitches for fursuits specifically. Um, the Henson stitch works really great with fleece. It doesn't work super great with um, muslin or, or cotton or any of those kind of things. Um, hence, puppet stitch. Henson stitch. Um, but yes, those are some stitches that are really, really good to know for your puppets. And the tighter you make them, like the, the less space when you're doing that ladder going down, the tighter your stitch is going to be. If you do like huge spaces, go over huge space, you're going to have, uh, you're going to see that in your stitch. Um, I have some here because why not show you something that I did wrong, right? So you can kind of see on, on this one, this is an angry cashew from the angry trail mix. Um, you can kind of see that in there. We weren't worried about it and we actually did put um, pen in here to accent it just because, just because we were cool with it, designer was fine with it, liked the kind of pattern of it, um, so we went with it. But if, if we really, really wanted this to be perfect, we would go a lot tighter in there as well. Cashew came on, great. All right, so one other thing I wanna mention when you're dealing with um, skinning and that kind of thing. So this is from a penguin. Uh, it's his body, obviously. Uh, if you are doing the head on here and you want the head to have a ton of movement, like back and forth and do all sorts of things, what I would do is have your head basically attached to an arm sleeve and send your arm sleeve all the way down to the bottom here and stitch it into the bottom. That way, although there is pins in here, um, that way you have full free motion that you can do in, inside of here. If you stitch your head directly onto the top, you're only going to have as much movement as the foam and fabric allow. So keep that in mind. So there's that. Um, let's talk about eyes. Kind of doing this in order of how I would build a puppet. So if you're like, I would do eyes first, that's totally cool. So once you have uh, your puppet that is all skinned, awesome, let's talk eyes. Tons of different types of eyes out there, tons of different types of eyes you can build. Um, I used to be very much a purchase them kind of person and then Safer at Home happened and I was building puppets in my apartment and could not uh, get stuff in for shipping and things like that. So I had to start making my own eyes, uh, super easy. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is safety eyes. I'm pretty sure most of you know what safety eyes are. They're the little plastic eyes that have the stem and you put a cap on it. So you put it through your fabric and your foam and you put a cap on it and that holds it in place. You can buy these in a ton of colors. You can buy them in a million different sizes at this point. Um, but these are a great resource. If you're going for something uh, bigger or a size or a color that you can't find, fear not, you can make your own. So if you get some of the small ones of these that are just black, or if you have some lying around and you want to like spray paint them black, you can use those to make the rest of the eye. So what I have is some molds. They're just half circle molds. Um, and what I do is pour a little bit of epoxy resin, just clear epoxy resin, into these so that, I don't have one that fits, um, I pour it high enough so that if I put this in, the top of this safety eye will be flat with the top of this mold. So that's how much I put in first. Let that cure and then I'll put a little bit in and sink this in exactly where I want it, pour the rest of the clear and then demold, pull it out and you essentially have your own safety eye that has the post on it then what I've done in the past is take a paint pen. I, I feel like they work kind of the best if you just need a color that you can get a paint pen in and do paint pen. The brighter and more opaque it can be on the back, the better it's gonna look shining through. Um, but yeah, I just blue, orange, whatever on the back of it, let that cure, 
Uh, most paint pens are not going to wash off, so they're going to stay on there even though you're putting it right on fabric as long as it is all dry. And then you have your own eye. Um, if you need a bigger eye in this style, ornament. Ornament, like fillable ornaments are amazing. Um, if you saw the hippo picture that was going around uh, of Thorwald, uh, his eyes are made with these where I poured resin in, exactly what I just said, all of that. But what I did at the very end was I poured a little bit of tinted resin on top to give the color. Um, and the reason that I put a safety eye in versus just painting it, it's number one, I get the tab, but also this dimension helps so much when you're dealing with puppets. Um, puppet eyes are so important. Focus is so important when it comes to puppets and puppeteering and where they're looking. Um, so letting that little dimension happen means that a puppet doesn't have to be directly looking at you. It can be offset and still look like it's looking at you. Does that make sense? Um, so that's really, really helpful. You can also just paint these. If you saw the unicorns on, uh, that were going on, I just painted the insides of these because they needed to be opaque anyway. Super, super helpful if you need these kind of big eyes. Another way that you can do big eyes, um, which is what these are, they're model magic, like legit model magic and a soap mold. So all I did is take, you get model magic craft stores. It's an air dry, lightweight clay. It's not even clay really, but, um, but model magic, check it out. All I do is put them in, like stuff it in about halfway, let it cure. Normally it's an overnight or dry time, pull it out and then I fleece it. So you can use other types of clays. You can use other types of things. The great thing about Model Magic is it's very light and I can shove a pit into it, which is cool. So if I'm a puppeteer and my puppet is up here for a really long time, adding as little extra weight as possible is amazing and doesn't do this as you're performing. So that's why I go with these. Um, super awesome. And again, you can get different kinds of soap molds. So I have metal ones here. I have plastic ones here. You're not gonna see the Model Magic or the clay or whatever you're using. So whatever fleece you put over it is what you're gonna see. So don't worry about like digging them out or trying to make them look perfect. Not, not a big deal. Um, another way that you um, do this, another way you can do like these safety eye things is if you take something like epoxy sculpt, which is a, a two-part epoxy polymer kind of clay, uh, you can do the same thing concept-wise that I did with the resin. But let's say you have this, but you want it to be this big and, and still flat. You can just stick it onto here or shove this tab into a piece of like pink foam or blue foam and sculpt your own, whatever size you want, and hand paint that too, um, just using these safety eyes as a base which is super cool. So those are a bunch of different types of eyes that you can see. Throw these all in here quick. Slide that over. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about are eyelids and eyebrows. So puppet eyes. Super, super important. Super, super um, amazing when it comes to focus. So one thing that we like to do is make the eyes really pop out or, or be the main focus when you're looking at the puppet. So if I just have, like I said, model magic, I can put pins in the eye. So these are actually just pinned on right now. Um, so let's say I just have this. It's not as exciting. It, it doesn't pop as much. I know I'm going to put a pupil on, but, but if you take a half circle, a half oval, and this is just fleece, you can basically create its character or um, its expression or whatever you want. So let's say I want just, just the eyelid on top. This one I did on top and bottom, or you can just put it on the bottom. They look a little bit more anxious that way. And then wherever your focus is going to be. So if you want, if you want your puppet to basically be cross-eyed or out or straight on, it's just a matter of where you put your pupils. 
So let's say I want them together. You can do that. Side. Totally cool. Eyelids really, really help give character though. Um, and eyebrows as well. So let me grab, you already saw cashew. Let's grab these ones. So this is M&M and almond, angry trail mix. So almond here, what we did on a lot of these, I used the soap mold that was more oval um, so that I could kind of tilt these a bit. I put the eyelid underneath and then we kind of gave them furrowed eyebrows. This is just fake fur. Fake fur is great for putting eyebrows on. These are all just stitched on. When I do facial features, I tend to try and stitch as much as possible and not glue in case I need to get in and do repairs or do something really quick or pull one off, then I'm not dealing with glue residue. Um, but you totally can use glue as well. The pupils are actually on with glue. So the next thing we did, eyelid, I creased it. So I just put stitches in there to give it that crease. These guys are supposed to be angry and upset. Um, so they, they have that. Uh, if you have alcohol pens or Sharpies, that kind of thing, that's what this detail is under here. We took those and we went in and kind of colored in detail. Um, if you were to have like the cashew, that crease in there, we put the pen in there. Uh, the mouths too, to give them a little bit more wrinkle look on the lips, like they're more pur pursing their lips together. Um, but alcohol markers, the reason I say alcohol is in case you do have to wash your puppet, you don't want to use a washable marker because it's all going to come off or bleed or terrible things could happen. So an alcohol one, um, we put it on, wipe it off or blend it right away so there's no extra residue, that kind of thing on there. Um, but I feel like it gives it a little bit extra uh, just character. You can make their eyebrows kind of furled up. I'm having way too much fun with this. I hope you all are too. Uh, and then same thing with M&M. &M. Uh, so we have his furled little eyebrows there. He also has the eyelids underneath um, and the pen in there as well and the pen in the mouth. So when he opens his mouth, when we're talking about um, puppeteer comfort, his, ten, his leans down versus going straight across. So my hole is actually all at the bottom so that my wrist, when I'm talking with him, um, he came out of a bag of trail mix. So he can do that, but it's also completely open. So if I do need to look down or look over, it's all exposed so that I have free range of motion on these. Um, a lot of times if you're doing puppets and you're to this stage and you're like, oh, I don't want to see this wrist, you can stitch in a sleeve, typically spandex just because it stretches and can be tighter, but you can put spandex in here to cover that sleeve so you really can't see the puppeteer. So um, let's see. We talked about- Nikki, I'm going to give you your five minute warning here. We have to wrap up pretty soon. Thanks. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, so. One thing that I did want to mention about the eyelids, because uh, I said that I stitch them on typically, um, I will take this, I hope you can see this all, I'm sorry. Uh, I will take it and I will fold it over, just the fleece, so that I'm having just a cleaner edge on here uh, versus having it flat out and stitching it down. Um, also, that little bit of 3D helps and you can go in and you know do marker and things like that but I fold it over and I do either a ladder or a Henson stitch. A lot of times a ladder stitch because it's easier when you're doing these smaller things um, than the Henson one, but that's what I will do to attach all of these. Um, that's what all of these are as well. So just a hint, trick little hint thing. If you're gonna glue, I would do the same thing. I would fold that over and glue that underside down versus just having them out. It just gives a lot cleaner look to your puppet in general, because you have already put a ton of work into this, if you've gotten to this point, and you want it to look good, right? I want them to look good. So same thing with your stitches. There's times where I've pulled out a stitch because I didn't like how it looked. Can your arm so you can see it? Um, but it's up to you. It's really up to you. There's no real right or wrong with puppets. They're just really awesome and cool, so. Um, all right, so. 
that is what I have to show you. Um, if you have questions, I'm going to pass that over to Stephanie because she's been watching the chat, which I have not. So. Okie doke. All right. Well, one of the earlier questions was somewhat related to the, the Antoine Fleece. And it looks like someone posted a link to puppet pelts, but I don't know if you have other information about uh, that particular. There's Nyla Fleece was mentioned in the chat as well. Yep. Uh, Nyla Fleece is great. Uh, Antrim Fleece is great. There's so many fleeces out there. Uh, puppet pelts is, is great. There's a lot of places out of New York that you can get them. Uh, one of the really cool things about now, Amazon carries it. You can actually buy yards in different colors on Amazon. Um, so really, if you do a search for Antron fleece, uh, number one, they're going to know that you know what you're talking about because no one knows about that and people don't make blankets out of that. Um, so if you just search it, you'll, you'll tend to find the places um, that carry it locally for you because, uh, you know, shipping from New York to Wisconsin is different than Chicago to Wisconsin. So it's kind of wherever you are. So. Like, yes. All right. And, and another question was asking a little bit about the benefits of the Henson stitch versus the ladder stitch. Sweet. The Henson stitch will pull it tighter um, and you won't have, I'm going to try and find this. Um, so if you can see this crazy detail, uh, you can see that it swivels a little bit. The seam itself swivels a little bit. Not a big deal on the back of a puppet because you rarely ever see that. Um, but your ladder stitch, unless you are doing like a millimeter, like dropping down a millimeter, going over, dropping down a millimeter, it's always going to have just a little bit because the fleece stretches. That's why the Henson one is specific for fleece and for puppets, because it does go back up and down. So it's pulling one big side to a point and then one big side to a point. So it's, it's pushing everything together a little bit tighter. So that's the main benefit. All right, another question was, how do you wash your puppets? Ooh, how do I wash my puppets? There, I do two different styles of washing puppets. Um, one, I learned from the puppet guy uh, here before he left, which is literally using a dye vat, filling it up with like water with just a tiny bit of soap in it, and, and submerging your puppet in there and kind of using your hands, wiping it around. That typically takes about 36 hours to dry if you submerge your puppet. Uh, it also depends what type of foam, like when you use dry fast or the thicker reticulated foam, it literally dries fast. So it's not as long of a process. Um, the other thing I will do is these ones actually just all got this during Safer at Home. I will take dish soap and a toothbrush and a little bit of water with dish soap in it and just literally do a toothbrush and do little circles and brush this out and then take a wet rag and just keep uh, wiping and dabbing until all the soap is gone. Let it air dry and then I will normally take just a brush to it um, depending sometimes I'll do like a, a fleece eater like what you have for your sweaters. Um, I'll do that kind of thing on there too. Those are the two main ways that I do them if, if it's a quick thing or a long period thing. So. Um, all right, and there was a question here about um, starter project for human forms. Mm -hmm. uh, suggestion um, for maybe a way to start that. Yes, I'm so glad someone asked this. Y'all, the internet is amazing. It's so great. Um, so Almond is actually a pattern that I found on the internet. My first time when I do a puppet, I go straight to the internet and see if there is a free pattern out there for um, a stuffed animal that is kind of that shape, or a puppet already, and there are a ton out there. So this is a typical puppet head shape. Um, it's kind of that Bert, Bert and Ernie, like Bert style, where it goes taller. Um, and I believe the one that I found, you can adjust how much dome is up here. But this is, this is a, a pretty standard one, and you can find these all over. When it comes to these rounder ones, I found a template for how to make a circle with basically just staves. Um, and that's why there's a version of this in this kind of foam, because it's way easier to pattern out. Um, and then just kind of cut the mouth in where I wanted it and that kind of thing. Um, seriously, internet, like if you search 
anything about puppets, you will find something because puppets are awesome now and people are coming out of the woodwork for them. There's also some YouTube guys that um, do how to build puppets uh, videos too. Um, the one guy's name is Adam and I'm totally blanking on his last name, but it starts with a K. I will find that. I will find that and post that somewhere. Um, but he has a bunch of how-to videos as well. And there are several suggestions within the chat for folks as well, if they're paying attention to that. See, um, I knew all of you know this <laughs> stuff. Um, someone did ask about whether there was, if you know of any summer or winter break intensive workshop type things focused on puppetry. Um, I do not know any that are like time specific. Um, UConn has a puppet degree or a puppet certificate that you can get. Um, the puppets here or the puppet builder that was before me here, um, he actually, he did it. They do a lot of rod puppets. They do a lot of puppets around the world, not just this style. Um, but it's a really great resource. He showed me some of the things that he was working on and some of the, the paperwork and things. It's really great. A lot of this you can look up and find on your own and work on your own. Um, another thing is the Stan Winston School. It does a lot of prosthetics. It does a lot of animatronics, but its core is puppets. Um, it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but you can kind of do it on your own time. And you can go through and learn all different puppet techniques with very modern products. Like a, a lot of the stuff that we're doing, yes, there's modern products, um, but the technique and everything is the same from back in the day. So there is that kind of bridge you can go as well. It looks like just a clarification, Adam Croding Croidinger, yes. or Croidinger. Yep, yep, so. that's him. He is very energetic. Like, I don't, can't be that energetic for that long, but he is um, really great too. So, and with that, it sounds like you rely a lot on internet resources, but there was a question if there are any favorite books in addition to the internet resources that you refer to. Oh, oh there are. It's so far away <laughs> right now, though. I don't want to run and grab it. Um, there are a ton of books out there. There's a lot on rod puppets. There's a lot on specifically lantern puppetry, so like shadow puppetry, um, Turkish shadow puppetry. There's so, so much out there. So if you're looking for just specific Muppet stuff or this kind of patterning, also look to cosplayers, but um, look at costume designers and costume drapers and patterners because uh, a lot of that flat patterning into 3D objects is kind of what they do. So if you know craft artisans, um, I, I just want to go run and grab this book really quick. I swear, I'll be right back. You could say the next question though. Okay, I think that would be something about maybe sourcing the foam for the base, if there's a particular source you have yes. for that. Okay, I will get to that in one second. Um, I love this book. It is foam patterning and construction techniques turning 2D designs into 3D shapes. They do not pay me to say that, but this is a really, really great book. You can see the mask on the front because this is based in costumes. So they talk a lot about different ways to do flat patterning, different ways. This one specifically is dyeing fur and antron fleece. Opened up to the perfect page. Um, but this is a really, really great book. As far as sourcing fabric or sourcing foams, um, like I said, L200 you can get at craft stores now. Upholstery foam you can get at craft stores. Tends to be more expensive there. Um, out of Milwaukee, we use an, uh, active foam. Um, they have a place in Chicago, they have a place in Milwaukee, they have places all over the place. We order directly from them and go pick it up. I am sure there's more. I know online there is uh, Foam Mart. You can get all different foams from there. Uh, there is a place that I was looking up earlier that is called cosplaysupplies.com. Um, so depending on what type of foam you're looking for, you can always go the cosplay route as well. All right, well, I, I think we've actually worked through all of our questions that have popped up here. And Oh, man. If you have other uh, last words or we'll turn it back over to Jim, one of the two. Oh, man, I talk so fast. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, one thing I will say is it, I haven't been following the chat. I'm very sorry. But it sounds like you all have resources and you all have really um, great things to share. Like, this is just me up here talking about puppets. But if you go to our Facebook um, group, which is, what is it? It's Props and Beyond Powered by Spam. 
Um, if you have any tips or tricks or anything like that that you want to uh, post on there for everyone, that would be awesome. Resources, that kind of thing. If you have other questions that pop up, I tend to check that too. So um, that's a really good way to get in contact with me personally, but also the rest of the group that knows uh, all this stuff as well. So thank you so much for watching this and babbling along with me. Uh, Jim, take it away. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Stephanie. And hey, thanks, Nikki. This was a really fun and informative presentation. Appreciate it. Yay. Okay. Uh, folks, uh, grab your Sharpies and uh, pull out your calendars. It's time for coming attractions. All right. Let's see. Well, I'm coming up on Sunday, October 18th at 7 p.m. Central Time. SPAM member, Yale Repertory Theater Prop Supervisor, and Yale School of Drama Lecturer Jen McClure will present Bloody Hell, Ways to Execute Special Blood Effects. You're going to want to tune in for this. It's just in time for Halloween. Following Jen on Sunday, November 22nd, SPAM member Ben Homan, the Properties Director at Utah Shakespeare Festival, will be speaking about and demonstrating Prop Textures 101, demonstrations of using common, affordable items to elevate your props to the next level. And closing out the 2020 season on Sunday, December 20th, will be SPAM member and Penn State University Prop Supervisor and Instructor Jay Lasnick. Jay's been building props since his sophomore year in high school. He'll share 35 years worth of his prop and costume crafts portfolio with us. You can find us on Facebook at Props for the Stage and Beyond, powered by SPAM. And with any luck at all next year, you'll see us at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festivals and be able to drop by our booth at USITT for a visit. Spaminar is produced by the Society of Property Artisan Managers, with special thanks to the SPAM Education, Publicity, and Finance Committees. Thank you all once again for watching. Now go wash your damn hands, put on your masks, vote, and prop on.